one who is going to talk about a most, perhaps the most feared government agency in America. The David of the fight against this agency, however, is our speaker. He beat the Goliath called the IRS. That every April 15th, so many people feel coerced that they have to sign a piece of paper called the 1040 Income Tax Confession Form, which has been misnamed as a return, as if you took something from the government to return to them. He refused to sign that form because he verified for himself that there is no law requiring him to file the 10 for income tax confession form and pay the income tax. And he took a very bold stand. He talked to a lot of people about it. Pardon? And when the, and he was able to beat the IRS Goliath when they came after him. So please help me give a warm hand of welcome and hear the story of Mr. Robert Lawrence. you all won't mind if I take just a minute uh, to set everything up here because I, I don't have everything written down because it would take too much paper. And so I have it all on my laptop here, so it's going to take me just a second to set up, so kind of bear with me for just a moment. I'm also a little nervous. <laughs> and I'm hoping that today's lectures will make crystal clear why I have a reasonable belief in accordance to the dictates of the Supreme Court as to why I believe what I believe. But before we get started, there's a few people I've got I've to thank, and I want to first off thank you, because you are a peculiar people, believe it or not. And peculiar also is not a bad thing. Turn this up just a little bit. Is that better? Yeah, can you hear me? All right. Okay, great. So, um, anyhow, being peculiar again, as I was saying, is a wonderful thing. Because it means you're alive and you're awake and you're watching what's going on around you. And you don't have your head in the sand and you're not watching the, as the, the proverbial boob tube and having your brain sucked out every night. Okay? I love to put people around me who can think. I love seeing people who care about their country, about their posterity, and I hate these things. <laughs> because I don't know about y'all, but I'm an animated fellow. I like moving around. I don't like being pinned down. I guess it's that authority problem that I have. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> so, but anyway, I wish to thank Paymon for first off asking me to come to this meeting. Uh, we weren't sure whether or not we was going to be able to get it scheduled and everything, and his, and his uh, cast and crew uh, was able to work out the road bumps and whatnot and make this happen. Uh, I want to thank again you for coming to this event because, see, it shows me the desire and fortitude that you have, that you're willing to give up your time, your energy, your finances, to come to something like this to learn what some would say is insanity and some would say is crazy. But you know, there was a person that came here over 2,000 years ago and they said he was crazy too. And they crucified him as a heretic. We're in good company. Okay. Our founding fathers were considered crazy. Who do you think you are, you upstarts, that you can beat the largest navy and the most powerful army in the world? You ragtag bunch of little squirrel hunting militiamen. Who do you think you are? But you know, history shows who won. And so I don't want to, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because I have a tendency to get emotional when it comes to my country, my people. I promised myself I wouldn't do this today. <laughs> How many of you 
you, this is the first time you've heard me speak. Let me see a show of hands. Wow. <laughs> I'm impressed. I thought I saw a lot of you uh, in other places. So thank you. And uh, I am humbled uh, by the affection that I felt uh, from all of you here. But uh, there's a lot of people. You know, everybody says, man, you know, you know so much. Well, you know, none of us is an island. None of us come to where we are because of what we ourselves did. You know, we're all on a path together learning truth. And so with that, man, I have to, you know, and some of you, uh, I'm sure, hold very near and dear some things to you that I do. I'm a very religious person, if you will. But I have to call my creator by who I believe that he is, and I can't give him a title. So if this insults you, too bad. Okay? But I have to thank my creator, Yahuwah, for creating me to be who I am. Because without that, I'd be like everybody else and have my head in the sand. I would have said, oh, who, me, stand up? Uh-uh. i got too much to lose. I have a wife. I have children. I have a mortgage. I have car payments. I have everything else that you have. How can I give that up to make a stand that everybody else says will end in my doom? And you know what? I had to look at that real hard before I made that choice. And I was sharing a scripture with a friend of mine today at lunch. It says to be careful. You know, the the King James Version says one thing. It reads altogether different from what it really meant. And it says when you decide to take on a ruler and to devour him in combat, to rise up early in the morning and consider heavily what is before you. Well, you know, when you're going to take on the monster that everybody else on the planet is scared to death of, You better realize what you're doing before you take on the task. And everybody comes to you and they they want to glad hand you and pat you on the back and say, man, I wish I was like you. Really? Do you really understand the weight of what you just said? Do you want to have... By the way, Ross, stand up for a minute and verify if what I'm about to say is an actual fact. This man is a financial manager and advisor. Did you see when you looked at my financial records that I have $90,000 in credit card debts directly related to this fight? Yes, sir. Absolutely. I lost a job where I made between sixty-five dollars and $75,000 a year with a secured retirement, full medical benefits packages, and a job that I loved. Working with people that I, I liked and respected was very comfortable in my situation. But with sometimes when truth hits you between the eyes and you're going, hold it, folks, this isn't right. I've got to do something about it. You can't say that I have to step out of that comfort zone of where I know I have this, I can do my 25 years and retire here. This is no problem. And as all of you know, auto workers have a cushy job. <laughs> Those of you who believe that, I've got a bridge to sell you. Okay? Because when you're making a car every 54 seconds, 10 hours a day, it's not easy. Okay? But anyway, I'm not going to harp on all that. I want to thank also Lindsay Springer, who was the mind, I guess, trust, if you will, who put together all the proceedings, I'm sorry, all the the motions and the things which we put forward to the courts through my attorney, Oscar Steele. I want to thank him, too, for being a very dear friend. Um, And most of you say, an attorney is your friend? But yes, in this case, yes. He was my friend. I consider him a brother. Uh, Some people may not say, I don't see how you can do that. Because after all, they're members of these, you know, groups and cults, and they sell their soul to Satan. You know, well, that's not true of all of them. Okay, and so for those of you who are going to bring me those arguments, be prepared to be dusted appropriately, because I have many dear friends whom I would trust with my life, who are attorneys, and I met another one last night, whose name is Tom Cryer. Now, you tell me men like him are sold out. Okay? We are sacrificing much to make this happen for us all. 
So don't tell me they're all like that. And I have a very dear friend, one of my dearest, as a matter of fact, on this planet, who's right now sitting in federal penitentiary for contempt of court because he violated a court order because he was defending his clients despite what the court said. And he knew the ramifications of his actions when he did it. So don't bring that to me. Okay? Don't tell me, you know, there's probably going to be some other things I'm going to say to you today that's going to anger you. You know, and that's okay. You know, you don't have to like me. I'm not here to, uh, I guess, placate everybody's and, and soothe everybody's uh, understanding. But there's many, 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 many other people, and you all know who you are, who have been part of my life, who have helped kind of coach me along and try to get me to this place to where I have this understanding. And I'm hoping today maybe to open up just a few more doors for you. But I want to ask a few of you, just by a show of hands, I want your participation. I want you alive and hearing what I'm going to tell you today. How many of you here believe that there is a problem in the current system of taxation this nation has? Absolutely. Okay. Now, for those of you who are a little squeamish and are afraid that your pictures will be caught on camera, I'll understand if you don't raise your hand. But how many of you here are what's called non-filers? Okay. Now, here's a question for you. You know what that word means? Okay. I only raised it so you'd feel a little more comfortable. Okay. Because I'm not a non-filer. You know why? Because a non-filer is a person who is required to file a return and didn't. So understand the difference. I'm not a non-filer. I'm a person not required by law not to. Whether they want to believe so or not, and it's going to be painfully clear. For By the way, I've got, I, I, this is the first time I've ever done this, and I'm going to do it right now. Because I believe you're here. Somewhere in this audience right now is an Internal Revenue Service criminal investigations agent. And if you are here, I'm not going to diss you, and I'm not going to let anybody in this audience do it either. But would you stand up for a minute, because I want to ask you a few questions. Absolutely. If what they do is so above board and so absolute concrete in law, as so many hundreds of our compatriots have said, show me the law, and they have stood mute and done everything under the sun, but how hard could it be? And we repeat that here for those of you who may be with the agency. I challenge you to go back and look through the books. I have done every word search. I have done every historical reference, cross-reference notes, dug it inside and out, turned it upside down, and shook it, and it didn't ever fall out. So maybe you can help me find it to keep other people from making that same mistake should any of us be found in error. Or is it not the fact that you're trying to keep us from error? The problem is you're trying to keep us ignorant. Is that the problem? If that's true, then you are a co-conspirator to a fraud to a free people. And I hope that when it's found out, you are judged accordingly and treated for what you are. Okay. Right. I hope too that none of you have come here today looking for that proverbial silver bullet. Okay. The, you know the one that we put in the, the special magic gun and we pull the trigger and it kills the dragon, or the vampire, or the werewolf, or whatever it is that your particular monster is. Because the silver bullet is as mythical as the creatures you're slaying. They don't exist. No one size legal remedy fits all situations and circumstances. However, this one, the Paperwork Reduction Act, appears to fit to where our requirement to file does fall. And I'm not going to talk to everyone today about the legality of the income tax. Not an issue for me. Why? Because... They tell you on your notice of deficiency what type of tax is it they're trying to collect. Is it an income tax? No. Because if it did, in the type of tax, it would cite the citation of law which would require the tax. So what do they put in that box, Sean? I'm going to finger you over here and make you answer that question for me. 
The question was, on a notice of deficiency, what type of tax do they put in the box? Thank you, sir. 1040. Because the 1040 is the form which generates the tax. Oh, did you grasp what I just told you? There is no statutory imposition other than what they claim in the instruction booklet of the 1040 is 6001, 6011, 6012, which generates the requirement to file a return, providing you meet other requirements. So then the form itself generates the tax. So they're telling you the truth in a notice of deficiency. The 1040 is the nature of the tax. But what if you're not required to file it? What if the form itself doesn't meet the requirements of the law? What if Congress knew there was a problem and gave you a civil remedy that was an absolute slayer of the claim? And that's exactly what they did. So, the one thing that gives us fear is the unknown. Not knowing. Not being able to find. I don't know, how many of you are nervous about not knowing where that statute lies that generates the tax that you're supposed to pay? One guy, only one guy is honest enough to raise his hand too? Come on, people. Be honest. If you can't be honest now, where can you be honest? Any of you nervous about an agency coming after you and kicking in your door, throwing you out of your bed, stealing your car, wrecking your bank accounts, throwing your hiney in jail because you didn't comply? Well, I have some questions for those agents who I know are in this room. Very big questions. Now, I gotta find a file here in a second. Oh. And I've got a gratuitous plug for a friend of mine who came here today from LA to see me. Larry, stand up. Okay. Thank you, Larry, for coming. All right. He's an author, by the way, and this is his book. It's called Sell the Feeling. Now, why am I showing you this? Larry probably don't even know. But I plan to do this before he came down here. The reason being is because we are trying to form a harmony in our nation, are we not, amongst all the different patriot groups? Come on, let's hear it. That's the cause. So what is it that we are trying to do? We are selling to one another because if we just go out there and go ah, like a bunch of rabid dogs running around chasing each other, well, all with our each pet project, we're not going to get anywhere and our enemy counts on it. What is the number one rule in our government to keep you separated from everybody else? Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Blacks against whites. Blacks against Latinos. Whites against Latinos. Latinos against Orientals, gang versus gang, colors, turf, losing neighborhoods, make you fearful of your neighbors so you don't even know who lives next door, compartmentalizing you to the point that you're afraid to speak your mind. Get out of the box. Dave Von Kleist said something the other night so profound I have got to include it here again today. Get out of the cage they put you in. Understand what they're doing to you. Sell the feeling. That feeling is community. That feeling is patriotism, of nation, of belonging, of being a united people. That is what we are selling to one another. Stop scaring the bejeepers out of the people who know you by giving them the wacko theories that you cannot prove. You're free to understand them. Okay? But I get so tired, folks, of people coming to me and talking to me about idiocy that you cannot substantiate in fact. How many of you have ever been in a court of law? Okay. Now, hey, cool, I'm in good company. Now, here's what I want you to contemplate. Was it true? Tom Cryer, where are you? You here? He just left. Ah, oh, rats, I missed him. Tom, come up here for a moment. Give the man a hand. Come on. I came to respect. We spent four and a half hours last night in discussion. And a, and a hoorah. 
And I really respect this man. I really do. And I want it on the record that I do. Tom, tell these people, are they in a court of law or a court of facts? In which, in which scenario? We've You're got going, two. Okay, right, got here, two. We're, right, right here, we're triers of fact. The, the court, the judge tries law. The judge tries law. The jury tries facts. If you want to test the law, you have to test the law to the court, not to the jury. And that's a mistake that every one of us has made in advancing our defenses on the basis of willfulness is we think we're going to go in there and we're going to persuade and convince the jury that the law is thus and so. And the judge stops them cold because he's going to tell them very quickly the jury will receive the law from the court. If you have a problem with what the law is, you will try that with me. And that's why, for example, this motion that I filed puts the law to the court and tells the court, you tell me, where is the law? You show me the law. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Is that what you wanted? That's what I wanted. Thank you. Thank you. If you run the unity thing, we've got to stay on one point. We've got to stay on one point. That's absolutely true. And the point is, is that we... Who told us in the very beginning who was responsible for the maintenance of liberty? It's not your government. That's why we have a Second Amendment. The Second Amendment was instituted to protect us against those who would try us in tyranny and to make sure that we were put in as slaves. You are the ones who are, who are given a guardianship over the liberty of this nation and only by our apathy and non-action uh, can what they are continuing or what they are trying to do continue. And I honestly believe in my heart of hearts and down to the very soles of my feet that we can take this back. And I believe we can take it in much shorter time than what they did to take it away from us. Get this book. Get this book. It's a, it's, it's a very inexpensive book. It is, uh, I think like $20. And in it holds some revelations to how you can communicate to those you want to influence to join you in a cause. And by getting them to join you in a cause, we can unite the groups together into one united voice and one front and no longer be divided by the various different issues that are out there. That's the only way we're going to take it back. Say. So Larry, there's my 25 cent plug for your for your book and your website, even though you didn't ask for it. Okay, okay. So now let's move on. www.sellthefeeling.com. I forgot about the website. Forgive me, Larry. Okay, but only by your participation will we see the realities of what we want come true. Okay, let me quote, give you some quotes to show from the, from courts, U.S. Supreme Court rulings about your participation. The general proposition that freedom of expression upon public question is secured by the First Amendment has long been settled by our decisions. The constitutional safeguard, we have said, was fashioned to assure unfettered interchange of ideas for bringing about the political and social changes desired by the people. Roth versus United States, 354 U.S., 476 and at 484. Unfettered interchange as a right secured by the first. That is your right. Make sure you maintain it. The maintenance of the opportunity for free political discussion to the end that government may be responsive to the will of who? The people. And that the changes may be obtained by lawful means an opportunity essential to the security of the republic is a fundamental principle of our constitutional system. Stromberg versus California, 283 U.S., 359 and 362. I'm sorry, 369. It is a prized American privilege to speak one's mind, although not always with perfectly good taste, on all public institutions. Oh, I don't know if what everything's been said here in the last couple of days has been perfectly good taste, and I'm sure some of those find it quite distasteful on, up there in Washington, D.C., but the truth is often that way. And the opportunity is to be afforded for vigorous advocacy. What's the, what do you think they meant by vigorous advocacy? Anybody got any idea? Activism. Get up there and speak in that mind. Stomping your feet. Holding your breath if you need to until you turn blue. 
Beating on their door every day. Calling them about every hour to see if they got an answer for you yet. Dogging them until the day gets really long for them. Make them answer you. You know, uh, a friend of mine said that they had a problem with a car dealership. And the car dealership kept putting them off, putting them off, putting them off as to giving them an answer. And the car sat there day after day after day. And a person says, I have a remedy for this. And they go, what? So call them every hour on the hour until the car is done. And how long did it take? Less than a day. <laughs> the car was done after being, after being sitting there, after the car had been sitting there for a week. The First Amendment said Judge Learned Hand. I always found his name very interesting. Learned Hand. Where do, boy, parents have a sense of humor, don't they? Presupposes the right conclusions are more likely to be gathered out of the multitude of tongues than through any kind of authoritative selection, which means decisions held by your elected leaders. To many, this is and always will be folly. But we have staked upon it our all. United States versus Associated Press. And I could go on to several more, but I, by the way, pay, uh, how much time do we have? I didn't even ask before I came up here how much time we have. Anybody got any idea? Okay, I'm going to cut. I'm going to scroll down here. I'm going to cut to the chase on some of this because we all understand where we are. That ain't enough time. <laughs> okay, here I want to read some. Everybody, I always put this in here to make sure everybody understands. I am not a paid speaker. Reason being is because I'm under a 6700 injunction to say things I've never said. Can you believe that? People have said that I have stated that I said that paying the tax was voluntary. Nope. Paying the tax is never voluntary, folks. It's always mandatory. If it's imposed by law. So if it's not imposed by law, can it be a tax? Well, maybe. If it's imposed by a form, then what the form's got to do? The form's got to comply. Okay, so therefore, I'm hereby exercising my right under my uh, right to free expression of thought, free expression of opinion, my right to free association, and uh, this is not a matter of commercial speech. I have no vested interest in the outcome of the speech. I have no financial interest in anything here. I don't have anything to sell. Some of you ask me, where's my DVD? I don't have one. Where's your website? Don't have one. I don't have one. Other people have one that has all my stuff on it, though. Okay, so, I want to give you those two websites. One of them is from my attorney. www.oscarsteely.com Oscar Steely, S-T-I-L-L-E-Y dot com The other one is Lindsay Springer's website. And it is www.penaltyprotester.com Dot org. And Barry Smith has a website. Barry, where are you at? Where's Barry? Okay, Oscar Steely is O S C A R, as an Oscar Meyer, and Steely, S T I L L E Y dot com. I forgot, I got to tell you guys five times. Oscar Steely, S T I L L E Y dot com. Oscar Steely. All one word. www dot Oscar Steely dot com. That's five. <laughs> what? No, no, the. I did. <laughs> Calm down, y'all. Jeez. See, I told you you guys are scarier than the IRS. Uh, Lindsay Springer's website is www.penaltyprotester.org. Okay. And uh, Barry Smith, a very dear friend of mine who is here, uh, he has a couple of websites, so I don't know which one he's put some of these documents on, but you're welcome to go to his website as well. I'm going to skip through a lot of my history because of the time constraints. Um, that you're lost. I'm sorry. But anyway, the claims of the agency are, and as the courts have held, that your liability arises under the three statutes which they cite in the instruction booklet to the internal uh, by the Internal Revenue Service and written by the Commissioner on the 1040s instruction booklet. 
6001, 6011, and 6012, and their regulations. However, this, they claim in various courts that the requirement to file a return arises by statute. And that was the only thing I was thinking about bringing up here today was the three statutes and having them up on, on PowerPoint to see if you could find the clear wording of the Form 1040 on any one of those. And I can guarantee you it's not. However, in the regulations to Section 6012, there is a mention of 1040 there. But it's kind of ambiguous and gray as to how and who and what and when and where the requirement to file arises. Because, see, they, they do this other thing. They say, the requirement to file it arises upon the fact that you had income, by their definition, that exceeds the exemption amount found at 151D. Well, you go to Section 151D and you look at that, and then you go back and check it in the statutes at large, and you go, wait a minute. This says $2,000, but when I check over here, I don't find a set figure of numbers of dollars, which is also an undefined term in law, just as lawful money is an undefined term in law. So let's see. I'm getting Federal Reserve notes for exchange for these checks that I'm pay placing into my bank. And the Federal Reserve note is an undefined term in law. Ten minutes? Oh, heavens to Betsy. Skip through all this stuff. Wow. Okay. We're going to have to really skip through here. Let's get to the meat of the PRA. The question was that we placed with they are, the government said that they and how many of you have been to the web, any of the websites that say what the government's response was that they they bailed because of counting to, uh, problems. Okay, I showed Tom Cryer last night our motion for a bill of particulars, which was done two and a half months prior to their their removal on the PRA issues, or which I think was removal on PRA issues or dismissal. We put in there. All the things saying, hey, we want to know about these things. Is a 1040 valid? Does it have a currently valid OMB control number? Does it have an expiration date, an approval date? Does it have all these things? Wouldn't the first or second year law student say, surely he's reaching to the Paperwork Reduction Act as a defense if he's asking us things related to it? I would think so. Let's see. Um, you know, about three weeks before they dismissed with prejudice, the government asked for an extension of time because we were going to hold them to the uh, Speedy Trial Act. They wanted an extension of time to research the Paperwork Reduction Act. Pray tell why. Oh, I didn't raise it as a defense. Okay, because they didn't know about it until the day before trial. Or two days before trial. Hmm. Why did they ask for that then three, about two to three weeks before uh, we went to trial? I wonder. Could they have maybe figured it out? The PRA makes five requirements of all, all information collections request. It says, one, they must have an approved date. It must have an expiration date. It must have a valid control number. It must cite the statutory authority which compels the performance, i.e., creates the tax. And it must have a mandatory voluntary statement. And whether or not your participation is mandatory under the law, voluntary to require benefit, you know, etc. The 1040 fails on four of the five prong test, which makes it a bootleg form. Now, we found some interesting things under the 1980 Act. One of them, a, a district court judge ruled, well, as long as it has a date on the form, i.e., at that time, I think the, the case was a 1983 Act. No, it was a 1981 case, so it was on a 1040 for 1980. The judge said something very interesting. He says the form expires because it doesn't have an expiration date. The form expires on the calendar date of the form. Check the weight of that statement. He told you the truth. December 31st, 1980, the 1040 for 1980 died. Can you be compelled to performance on a form that expired December 31st on April 15th of the following year? No. So therefore, it's an expired form, and again, bootleg. There's a problem. So anyway, I'm going to skip on down here a little bit more. I have several things I'd like to, to cover, but it's kind of superficial. Let's go to 44 U.S.C. 3512. 
which is called the Public Protections Clause of the Paperwork Reduction Act. And here is the clear wording of the language uh, as imparted by Congress. It says, notwithstanding any other provision of law, no person shall be... I'm I'm going to try to read this in blocks so you can kind of grasp it. I'm going to go slow. Notwithstanding any other provision of law, that means the entirety of this book. The whole of it. Notwithstanding any other provision of law, no person shall be subject to any penalty for failing to comply with a collection of information that is subject to this subchapter if, one, the collection of information does not display a valid control number assigned by the director in accordance with this subchapter. Now, they just told you something incredible right there in the law. And most people don't see it because they gloss over it. Congress, by statutory construction, puts words within a statute for a reason. Why would they put the term valid in that statute? Because they know, without question, that there are OMB control numbers floating around out there that are invalid. So what makes that the first presumption and first question one should raise on any document? Is the number valid? Oh, the district court said you can go to the OMB control or OMB website and they have the numbers there. Hmm. I can go to a lot of websites and find all kind of things that make all kind of claims. Doesn't mean it's true. Hmm. The Paperwork Reduction Act says that the Office of Management Budget can only, by statute, issue a number valid for three years. Bing, bing, bing. And at the end of that third year, that number dies and can't be used anymore. Okay, so that's not the clear wording like that, but that was the intent of Congress. So now, for 26 years, we've had a form with the same number on it. The number is invalid. Congress knows it. But the IRS does this. The Congress says we're not going to abide by it under this 1980 Act because then the wording was current OMB control number. So in 1995, Congress saw a bifurcation in the courts. We've got this court over here, the circuit court, makes this ruling. Over here, we have a circuit court that makes an absolute, you know, diametrically opposed ruling. So we have a bifurcation in the courts. They can't come to an understanding and, and, and whatnot as to whether or not things are required under the Paperwork Reduction Act and whether or not the OMB control numbers are, are right or wrong. So Congress says, okay, we're going to fix it. We're going to rewrite the, the PRA and we're going to make the language stronger. And they added the term valid. But then they added Section 2, or actually, you know, which is, I want you to really get a full grasp of this. The agency fails to inform the... Oops. Yes, the agency fails to inform the person who is to respond to the collection of information that such person is not required to respond to the collection of information unless it displays an OMB control number. Okay? That was part two. Here's part B. The protection provided by this section may be raised in the form of a complete defense, bar, or otherwise, At any time during the agency's administrative process or judicial action applicable thereto, period, end of quote. That is Title 44, Section 3512B. So let me read it to you again, because one guy said, you got to educate you, you got to say it to you five times, I'm going to do it again. The protection provided by this section may be raised in the form of a complete defense, bar, or otherwise at any time during the agency's administrative process or judicial action applicable thereto. End of story. If the form is invalid, it's a bootleg form. I cannot be compelled to performance to fill the thing out, sign it under penalty of perjury, and waive my Fifth Amendment rights. Okay, two minutes. Okay. Man, I apologize, folks. I had so much other stuff I wanted to share. I'm going to really skip down to it. Um, but I want to go to 5 CFR 1320.6E. 
The projection provided by this paragraph for this section does not preclude the imposition of a penalty on a person for failing to comply with the collection of information that is imposed by on the person by statute, e.g. 6011A. Wait a minute. This says 6011A imposes the thing. The government says 6012. This court over here says 6011. We have a confusion in the statute and the court as to what is the imposition. Now, notice instead, 6012, alleges that, which is was, as alleged in the statutory origin theory, has no complete, no unified front in the court. We cannot have it, folks, because the law cannot contemplate what it, what, what's the word? I, it just went out the window. I'm sorry. I, just, I lost it. A paradox. It is either always this way or it's not. It's not this way sometimes or you're liable this time but not that time because they want you to believe that everything is, everything is taxable. If that's true, I'm not even going to argue that with them. But I am going to argue with them, does your form comply? If your form does not comply, I'm not required to file it. You can't do anything about it. Kiss my you-know-what and get out of my face. I've got one more thing I want to I want to share with you here before I close it down because I know I'm running out of time and I'm trying to scroll down. I want everybody to find a copy of the Pond versus Commissioner case in the Tenth Circuit. There's some very interesting things there. U.S. v. Collins. And for those of you who want a complete spelling of all that, see me afterwards and I'll be sure to give it to you. Uh, the complete defense bar otherwise is a prohibition. A complete defense tells me that it goes to every objection that can be made and it tells me that it applies to both civil and criminal penalty. And go look at the definition of penalty at 5 CFR 1320 because I don't want to give you everything. I want you to get out there and do some homework. One minute. Thank you very much. Go out and do some homework because after all, according to the Cheek and Brian cases, you have to have an understanding because you perform the research. You can't go make this decision and say, Bob Lawrence told me to do that. Won't hold. You got to know. So get active. Go see what 5 CFR 1320.3J says that it is. 5 CFR 1320.3 prens J close prens. Because none of that can be imposed upon you if the form is not valid. Okay? Thank you for your stand. Thank you for your love, your respect, and whatnot. For all, Paymon, you've got an incredible group. I want to uh, admonish you to continue with what you're doing. And don't say you want to be like me. Because if you do, you'll probably end up broke, unhappy. <laughs> and you see the smile? I love what I'm doing. Okay? I just, I, there's just some things I wish were a little different, but that's the way that things are. Every, every path we take sometimes has road roadblocks and, and, and humps and bumps to get over. But to let you know, when they come and attack me last year, being a contractor, they stopped every, all the work that I was doing from February to September. So from February last year to September last year, I did not bring in a dime. Because no one wanted to hire me. Because they didn't know if I was going to be there to complete the work. Because they were fearful that the agency was going to come in there and take care of things. And maybe a little later on, we can get together in some small groups and I can explain to you what happened in the appellate courts and uh, fill you in on all that. Uh, also, two IRMs. Go, uh, for those of you who can get on the web, I want you to go look at IRM section 21, 3.3, and you'll find out that there's two forms that the IRS, two types of forms that the IRS can send you. One is called an ICR. And one is a DPR. One's an information collections request. One is a document perfections request. Both must comply with the, uh, with the PRA, PRA. And guess what a DPR is? I'm going to spell it out for you here real quick. CP 515. CP 518. Letter 1058. Notices of deficiency. Okay. All those are called document perfections requests. They must comply with the act. And if they do not comply with the act, you have no legal responsibility to respond to them. Send them a nasty gram and say, prove up. Show me where your forms comply with the act. Or get out of my life and leave me alone. Thank you.
May Yahweh bless all of you.